Watch this. I just want to be there. The being so far away is hard. I have ugly cries every day. Try not to do it now. The Israel Hamas war continues today, with the death toll topping nearly 2,000, including several Americans. While the atrocities play out for the world to see, one Idaho woman can barely watch, even as she can't turn away. Is it more of the same for the Central District Health Board? The Ada County Commissioners have recommended a replacement for Raul Labrador, a former state lawmaker who's been very open with his views on public health. I don't get scared. Um, <laughs> so I like scaring people. This Nampa dad does it so well, he's competing in a national contest to be the next face of horror. And you can help him win. The world is watching as Israel defends itself from continued waves of aggression. The terrorist organization Hamas launched a surprise attack Saturday, killing hundreds of Israelis. Since then, you've likely heard the stories, seen the graphic videos and pictures. A music festival celebrating peace turned into a bloody and horrific attack on civilians. Children have been beheaded, hostages have been taken. For a while, the tales of atrocities coming out of Israel and Gaza were coming in so rapidly, it may have been hard to follow. That can be said of this entire ordeal. The war in Israel is a complex geopolitical conflict that has thousands of years and hundreds of layers to it. But for those with a connection to the area, one thing is very clear. That connection remains shaken, but still strong. Joe Paris spoke with an Israeli-American watching it all unfold from Boise. Sirens, rockets. <laughs> Bloodshed. These are all things that the people of Israel are used to. They're no stranger to conflict in the region. Saturday was something new, though, for many Israelis. A coordinated terrorist attack carried out by Hamas, surprising Israelis. Thousands of miles away stateside, Israeli Americans can only watch. The last 13 years I lived by the Lebanese border, they threw rockets at us every night. Michal Voloshin now calls Boise home, but she still is an Israeli at heart. She recalls a difference between Boise and Israel. One she noticed quickly. It was kind of hard sleeping here because it was so quiet when we went to bed. Uh, but so obviously it was always there. But yet I felt safe there. Um, luckily they always had bad aim. Uh, and we were so close to the border they wouldn't try to hit us because they might hit themselves. Very um, Zionist parents, especially my mother, who basically raised us to move to Israel. And we moved and then my parents followed later. So uh, grew up in Skokie, Illinois, very Jewish suburb of Chicago, moved to Israel. Uh, I loved it. I still consider it home. Um, we lived on a kibbutz in Israel, which is a communal settlement. Um, first down south near Eilat, and then the last 13 years up north, uh, where there's some unrest now, uh, right by Lebanon, and they weren't real good neighbors. The kibbutz communities near Israel's border with Gaza is where Hamas first struck, attacking people at a music festival. Israel in total is about the size of Rhode Island, which is our smallest state. So yes, it's tiny, but mighty. <laughs> and when you start to see the news, you know, uh, over the last week, you know, mm -hmm. wh what are your thoughts? Um, I'm horrified. I'm uh, outraged at the cruelty that's going on. Um, I'm upset that our intelligence didn't know it was coming. This is the first surprise war we've had for 50 years. The Yom Kippur War in uh, 1973 was a surprise, and we had a lot of casualties then. But the, and the cruelty of the Hamas and uh, the endangerment they're putting to their citizens who unfortunately suffer from this just like Israelis do. Um, Israel, Israelis don't want to kill Palestinians, but we have no choice. And uh, historically and now these terrorist organizations plant their rockets and everything by hospitals, by schools, by mosques. And so when Israel retaliates, we're blowing up hospitals and schools and mosques and we look bad. We don't want to do that. We always give warnings. They don't always tell their people because it strengthens their cause if they can report more casualties. Mm -hmm. But the initial inv invasion was by Kibbutz Far Aza, which is right by Gaza. 
um, they slaughtered babies, beheaded babies. Michal planned to be in Israel this week. The events since Saturday, though, will prevent her from going home. I mean, there are some really strong Israeli Arab connections within Israel. It's not as uh, apartheid as people make it seem. I mean, where I lived up north, there was an Arab village near us, and we would go there. We had friends there. I mean, the distance makes it harder. And on the news, you always see the worst of the worst. You don't see the Israelis coming together, the good side. And my mother's 92 years old. I'd rather be there with her right now. For now, like so many, Michal can only watch from afar. There's a phrase that's going around social media, and I've heard it said in a lot of news interviews, and a lot of Israelis uh, are saying, Am Yisrael Chai. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? The land of Israel shall live. Yeah. And in the context of this, you know, what's the meaning of it? Um, there will always be Israel. It will always be our home. It's, uh, it's our homeland. I mean, we've been there for ever. Uh, and, you know, families and friends are there. It's just, uh, it's just home. I mean, that's the best word I can use for it. The situation in the Middle East is an extremely complex situation, and to be frank, calling it complex is actually very naive. But Brian, as, as Americans talk about this and more people are introduced mm -hmm. to really the, the Middle East and kind of the geopolitics there, it's interesting to talk about, but at the same time, there's so much nuance to this conversation between Palestinians, Hamas, Gaza, Israel, Israelis, Jews. There's so many different words that are out in the lexicon right now that these conversations can get very personal very quickly. So I would advise folks that are not familiar with this, uh, Take a look, research some of the backstory, and try to understand what's going on there because it's not simple. Okay, so the land of Israel shall live. How does Michal think that this is going to end? Either this current conflict or, I guess, overall? There are uh, complex situations in the world and none more complex than a two-state solution in, right. in, in Israel and the Middle East. And for those that are unfamiliar, there are those that do support a two-state solution, which would be the state of Israel and then Gaza as, as a formalized Palestine. And it would be uh, in the interest of, you know, of geopolitics to work that out. However, there are some that are not looking through this through a political lens when they talk about the existence of Israel or they talk about the existence of Gaza or really the entire setup of the Middle East. It's complicated because you're not dealing with just politics. You're, you're dealing with religion. You're dealing with extremism. And when you have these layers stack on top of each other, it's, it's very difficult to capture in a five-minute news segment, never mind, you know, all day here on TV. Summing up five, thousands of years of history into five minutes is, is an impossibility. All right, thank you very much, Joe. Well, today, reactions after a federal appeals court, court ruled it will reconsider Idaho's near total abortion ban. That means abortions are once again legal if deemed necessary to save the life or prevent serious health risks to the mother. Idaho's abortion law was in full effect for about two weeks. The Ninth Circuit sided with the state of, the, of, of Idaho in the last week of September, but the U.S. Department of Justice, they appealed that decision. They still believe Idaho's law violates the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, or EMTALA. EMTALA requires medical providers at facilities that receive Medicare funds to treat and stabilize people in emergency situations, not just if their life is in danger. St. Luke's chief physician, executive Jim Souza, is glad the court's going to reconsider. And right now, he says, it is still confusing for doctors to know what is legal under Idaho's abortion law. I heard the news as a positive development because it's a chance to uh, maintain at least within emergency department sites and labor and delivery sites, a safe harbor where the health of the mother is still at play. So legal for now, when is that set date for the rehearing? That we don't know. When it does happen, though, a larger group of judges will hear the case instead of the smaller that made that previous ruling. When Attorney General Raul Labrador stepped down from his role in the Central District Health Board just a year and a half into his five-year appointment, the Ada County Commissioners set out to find his replacement. And they did, yesterday. In a unanimous decision, out of five candidates, they recommended former Idaho State Representative Greg Furch to fill that seat on the CDH board. Criteria, Ada County Commissioners said they were looking to satisfy. Would one be have knowledge of CDH, I assume more than just it existed, knowledge or participation on boards or commissions or committees, and three, have knowledge of financing and budgeting. Commissioner Ryan Davidson said he liked Furch for his experience in Idaho's legislature and his tenure on the House Health and Welfare Committee. So has a strong interest in health. Somebody who's been through the legislature, I think, understands the dynamic of a committee system uh, better than most. Um, he has uh, medical experience as a chiropractor 
chiropractor. Furch served one term as a state representative. Commissioner Tom Daly hung his, hung his hat on Furch's financial experience as a small business owner. So Ada County contributes the lion's share of the budget for uh, Central District Health. Uh, so budgeting is critically important to the process of the commissioners uh, on uh, the members of the Central District Health. There wasn't a whole lot of discussion on the actual public health side of CDH. This is a recommendation, by the way, because Furch's appointment still has to be approved by the commissioners of the three other counties covered by Central District Health. That'd be Valley, Elmore, and Boise. So what else might those counties be considering when it comes to Furch? Well, he's, he's a chiropractor with his own business here in Boise. He's a graduate of University of North Dakota and a former Army medic, according to the bio he turned into Ada County. He didn't include his stance on certain communicable diseases, though, something he's been pretty forward about when one considers his social media posts when it comes to the pandemic and the COVID-19 vaccine, questioning the efficacy of masks and pushing the theory the vaccine causes more harm than good. At least one of those posts had to be flagged by Facebook for being misinformation. He was also an outspoken endorser of Commissioners Rod Beck and Ryan Davidson, even donating to Davidson's campaign in 2020. And that's not illegal or questionable, by the way, just giving you some perspective on this. And speaking of budgets, if that is, in fact, a primary responsibility of Central District Health and not so much about public health, well, the second largest section of Central's, Central District Health's $17.5 million 2024 budget is the $2.2 million spent on communicable disease control. COVID-19 falls under that category and is more than half of that category's budget. It could get interesting when one of those board members with line item control has certain opinions on the efficacy of vaccines. One other, by the way, these views not too far off from the person he's replacing, the current state attorney general, Raul Labrador. We did try to ask Dr. Greg Furch about these ex opinions he has expressed on social media. He said he was too busy today and he just sent us his bio. So what else do you need to know in the 208? A couple of suspects are still on the loose. Police are asking for your help in finding them. Abby Davis explains it all in the 411. Ontario police are asking for the public's help in finding a person of interest. After 24-year-old Daniela Perez was found dead last night in the trunk of her car. The Malheur County District Attorney says around 4.30 yesterday afternoon, police were notified that Perez was missing and endangered. Her vehicle was missing as well. Authorities tracked her phone and found it in the trash can of a nearby truck stop. They then used OnStar to find her vehicle at a downtown Ontario parking lot last night where Perez was found dead inside. We don't know how she was killed, but police think foul play was involved. If you have any information, contact Malheur County Dispatch at 541-473-5125. One woman is dead, one man is in jail, and another man is on the run after a theft and high-speed chase in Meridian last night. Today, Meridian police say they arrested one of the suspects, 20-year-old Angel Murado, at a business on East Fairview Avenue around 10 o'clock last night. He was booked into the Ada County Jail. Police are still looking for the other person involved. Yesterday, around 5.30, Meridian police say they responded to a report of three people, one woman and two men stealing from the village at Meridian. They say the woman then got into a stolen car. That's when police started chasing her. Police say the woman turned south onto Eagle Road, jumped the median and hit speeds of up to 90 miles per hour and crashed into several vehicles. The woman died at the scene. The Ada County coroner identified her as 22-year-old Tylisha Evans of Payette. The drivers of the other vehicles were treated for minor injuries. An Idaho State Police spokesperson says they stopped the other chase after the man drove into Oregon. Oregon State Police say officers used spike strips. They add the car became disabled and the man got out of the car and ran across I-84. They say he got into a silver SUV believed to be assisting the suspect. Meridian police are asking anyone with information about the crash and thefts to call their non-emergency number. And that's the 411 on the 208. I'm Abby Davis. I've just always uh, loved Halloween from a kid. And apparently also as an adult. Now it's up to you if this usually normal Nampa neighbor should become America's next face of horror. 
You have something scary to share? Or maybe something that makes you laugh? Or just something about the 208? Send it along. Text us at 208-321-5614. Hopefully your grammar or choice of words will make us cringe. Oh, don't forget to include your name in the hashtag the 208 and stick around. We'll be sharing some of the good ones at the end of the show. October, the time when America's pastime, the traditional pastime, is in the playoffs, and a more modern pastime is basically making everything pumpkin spice. It's also about pumpkin space, as in making room for that gourd on the porch. Halloween decorations, and of course, costumes. One Nampa man does both every year to the extreme. And now, Chris Hasnerals, his elaborate costume is getting national attention in the face of horror con contest. And if he wins, if Chris does win, he gets to meet one of his horror heroes. So right now, let's meet the man behind the mask. Here's Chris. I love Halloween. It's just a great month decorating our yard and, and scaring the neighborhood. I can creep up on people um, or follow them around. Most of the time, I try not to speak. It's scarier if I don't speak. My um, name is Chris Hasnerl and I'm a contestant um, running to win the prize of the next face of horror. The winner receives a trip down to um, do a photo shoot with Kane Hodder, which is the Jason character, Friday the 13th. It would be an awesome, awesome deal to be able to meet a character from a horror movie that I love. I have watched all the Friday 13th movies. Yes, I am a fan of his. I love scary movies. I don't get scared. Um, <laughs> so I like scaring people. It's just the, the um, that initial, oh, you know, or the, the jerk that they have. <laughs> it's just fun doing that. And, and I've scared a lot of parents too, just by standing there and them not knowing you know, just like the kids, they don't know I'm a, um, a person. How long does it take? Yeah. Um, roughly, roughly about an hour to, um, you know, get it all touched up and then uh, the glue the pieces together and, and then add the wig and the hat and everything else. Appreciate the votes and looking forward to having this opportunity to go to Hollywood and meet Kane Hodder. Only about an hour, that's impressive. So how can you vote for our Idaho representative? Chris said the easiest way, just find his Facebook page. It's his name, Chris Hasnerall. It's spelled, well, Chris Hasnerall, H-A-S-E-N-O-E-H-R-L. There it is right there. All you gotta do is click on the Face of Horror post, which takes you to his Face of Horror page. Vote, and you can vote for free with Facebook verification. You can vote every 24 hours, so do it more than once, every other 24 hours. You have until tomorrow night at 9 p.m to vote in this round, in this round, multiple rounds. 
there are multiple rounds to go. So check back every week till November to see if Chris or how Chris is doing to see if he might need a few extra votes and you can send one his way. Also, he said he's still trying to find a name for his zombie character because I guess zombie Chris ain't going to cut it, which is right. It is kind of boring. So if you have any ideas about that, text those to us as well. 208-321-5614. We get some good ones. We'll pass them along to Chris, maybe even share some at the end of the show. Gorgeous shot there of the fall foliage in the Teton Valley. And look at this shot from today up at Tamarack. Your eyes do not deceive you. We had the first measurable snowfall of the season for most of our area ski resorts. The Tamarack snow stag had about four inches on it this morning. Most of that has melted away now. But here's a look at Tamarack right now. Still shrouded in clouds. You can kind of see here the snow on the ground. I don't think it'll stick around all that long. Maybe a day or two before it starts melting away. But still, I know you skiers and boarders love of seeing this right and some very light snow did fall on Baldy at Sun Valley. A lot of that will likely again start melting away tomorrow, but still this is a live look. Look at the low clouds hanging over the mountain. Really beautiful look there. It looks a little ominous as we look towards the mountains from Boise. You can see the sunshine kind of behind the camera illuminating the foothills and then it looks a little gloomy beyond that. It has been a very brisk fall day, so we're only at 57 degrees in Boise right now and you have to also factor in these gusty blustery winds right out of the north Northwest will have a bite to them, getting stronger as you head towards the Magic Valley. So along the I-84 corridor, it's been a bit blustery. And all of this is part of a system that is continuing to march across central Oregon right now. So still sending some showers our way, a couple of sprinkles possible in the Treasure Valley. I don't think we'll see much in the way of precipitation. And this will kind of race to the south and the east overnight. So tomorrow it'll clear out. We'll have sunshine. However, we will still keep a brisk northwesterly wind in play tomorrow. Not quite as gusty as today. 
today. But in areas where we get calmer overnight, there's a possibility early of some fog developing. So just bear that in mind if you're headed out early tomorrow. Temperatures will rise into the low 60s, still below average, but not as cool as today. And with all the sunshine, it should help immensely for your Thursday. After that, some gorgeous conditions set in. We'll see low 70s over the weekend with some clouds coming and going. Our warmest day is Monday with a high of 75. All right, let's get to your comments on this Wednesday. Back on the 208. Sadly, given Hamas wants to kill all Jews, Israel has no choice but to open a humanitarian corridor and then after the civilians leave, bulldoze Gaza. Would you let a rattlesnake hang out on your front stoop? Asked David from Boise. Meanwhile, this is Kip taking a little play on Halloween season. It is Halloween season at CDH. We're being tricked with this latest board nomination. But as I mentioned, not really much of a trick if it's basically the same one. You're replacing one with somebody who's very similar as the one before, so not much change there. What does it mean when you only have one or two comments on the 208 at the end of your show? Too few comments or the news topics ran too long, asked Jack and Meridian. Both can be true. Both can be true. We'll try it again tomorrow.